Last week, we began the service with a reading from Luke 4. And this week, the gospel text and the lectionary continues that story in Luke 4, and so it's to that passage that we return today. One of the ways that I have learned to read the scripture is through imagining myself as being a part of the story, uh, imagining myself as, as participating in the scripture somehow. And as I did that this week, I realized that I was a part of the crowd that responded to the words of Jesus in this passage. And as I continued to think of it, I continued to think of you as my community of faithful people uh, responding to Jesus with me. We are, in effect, that crowd that receives a word from Jesus and seeks to respond to him. And so as we go through the scripture this morning, I thought it would be interesting to have a little bit of uh, crowd participation. So what we're going to do, I'll put the words, we'll put the words up on the slides on the screen, and I'll read to you the actions and the words of Jesus, and then we, as the participating crowd of the faithful people, will respond to the words of Jesus as they do in the story. So I invite you now to stand as you're able and join me in telling this story. Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue as he normally did and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me, he has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant and sat down. Every one of our eyes are on Jesus as we wait with anticipation for his next words. Jesus began to explain to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. Everyone was raving about Jesus. We are amazed by the gracious words flowing from Jesus' lips. This is the son of one of our own, Joseph, is it not? Then Jesus said to them, undoubtedly, you will quote this saying to me, doctor, heal yourself. Do hear in your hometown what we've heard you did in Capernaum. He said, I assure you that no prophet is welcome in in the prophet's hometown. And I can assure you that there were many widows in Israel during Elijah's time. And when it didn't rain for three and a half years, and there was a great food shortage in the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to a widow in the city of Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. There were also many persons with skin diseases in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha, but none of them were cleansed. Instead, Naaman the Syrian was cleansed. When they heard this, everyone in the community of the faithful was filled with anger. Let us rise up and run this prophet out of town. We'll take him and throw him from the cliff. They led him to the crest of the hill on which their town had been built so that they could throw him off the cliff. Cliff. But he passed through the crowd and went on his way. This is the story of God told by and for the people of God. Thanks be to God. He may be seated. So Jesus announces the good news of the kingdom of God and the people are amazed. And then Jesus seems to instigate them. Telling them that he knows what they'll say and how they'll react and how they'll respond. Even though this ancient scripture from the prophet Isaiah was fulfilled on that day, they will not accept it. And all the people said, not today, not you, and not them. Why do you imagine that this crowd would change their mind so quickly about this good news? I contend that it's because this is a familiar story. This is a story that's familiar even to us today. This is a story that's really about us and about them and about the acceptable breadth of the good news. So first, let's talk about the us in this story. Luke makes this the first recorded event in Jesus' public ministry. We do, do know that Jesus has already been at work in other places. Jesus even mentions the work that he's already done in Capernaum. But Luke establishes this story as the beginning, the foundation. 
And it's in this story that we see who Jesus is, what Jesus is doing, and the response that Jesus' work brings. And this story begins at home. Nazareth is filled with the people that Jesus has known his entire life. The word Nazareth itself comes from a Hebrew word, netzer. And netzer means shoot or branch, a branch that comes forth from a tree. One of the most common biblical images for the people of God is that of an olive tree. And one of the most significant prophecies about these people is again from Isaiah. And it says that a netzer, a shoot, will spring up from the root of Jesse, from the lineage of David. And that this shoot will be a signal to the people saying that the activity of God is coming to liberate them from their oppression to free them from slavery, and to bring them home from exile. One scholar that I follow has posited that Nazareth is a city of those awaiting this Netzer. In Jesus' time, Nazareth was a small town, less than 500 people formed very recently by people returning from the exile still finding themselves under the oppressive empire, this scholar imagines that perhaps several people from the tribe of Judah, from the lineage of David, decided to plant their own town and to wait for this prophetic netzer to come forth from their own offspring to bring the good news of their liberation. This may be why the crowd is initially so impressed. Is this not Joseph's son, This is one of our own fulfilling an Isaianic prophecy of release, of liberation, and ushering in the year of the Lord's favor. Could this be the shoot of Jesse, the netzer that we have been waiting for for so long? But even with that possibility, the next words out of Jesus' mouth turns the crowd against him. The people that he had known his whole life, his friends, his family, his teachers, his mentors, classmates, the elders of the village decide that they'd rather kill Jesus than tolerate the words that he speaks. But why? Maybe it's because of what the words from Isaiah that Jesus read actually mean. So let's look at this so-called good news of which Jesus speaks and see if we might find the cause of the uproar. The words that Jesus reads in that synagogue are in the 61st chapter of the scroll of Isaiah. They're part of a long poem that explains how the people will return to their land from exile and rebuild their nation. Isaiah even uses this word netzer again just before this passage to describe the planting of the people returning back to their land. This passage from the 61st chapter is worth another read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, and to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. There's a few quick things to note about this passage. It's written first from the perspective of someone that says that they are filled with the Spirit of the Lord, the one that the Lord has anointed. This is the Hebrew word Messiah. For us today, for Jesus to claim this identity is not shocking. And we know that it's for this salvific figure that those people waited And so I don't think it's the claim to the messianic identity that enrages the crowd. Isaiah goes on to describe the vocation of this anointed one by using a series of verbs. The task of this anointed one is to do good news. And this verb is interesting because it's not actually a verb. It's the word gospel essentially made into a verb. To do the good news for the poor. To call forth liberty for the imprisoned and sight for those that are blind to the injustice around them. To liberate those that are oppressed by the empire. And finally, again, to call forth something new. To call forth to usher in the year of the Lord's favor. I think we can all agree that this is pretty good news. The poor receive goodness, prisoners are released, and oppressors realize their culpability. Those that have been abused, beaten, kidnapped, arrested, imprisoned, and stripped of human dignity are again allowed into society. They're given freedom and liberation and value. 
But the year of the Lord's favor is the big one in this prophecy. The year of the Lord's favor is this year of jubilee. It's what Lisa Sharon Harper explained in the video that we watched at the top of the sermon. This is the year when slaves are set free, when poor are not forced to work for the benefits of another, when property is restored to its initial owner at no cost, and when loans are forgiven no matter how big or how new. If you want to know more about this year of Jubilee, it's described in depth in Leviticus 25. According to the Torah, this event, this practice of Jubilee is ordained by God. Maybe now we can begin to understand why these words bother the crowd. I know that that video is difficult for us to hear today. It's hard to imagine a world in which this type of governance is possible. And for many of us, it's not even something that we would desire. But is this enough to enrage the crowd? To instigate them towards the murder of one of their own? We all have friends and family that think differently about economics than we do, but I hope that none of us have attempted to kill them. We're still left with this question of why. The answer to that question is because of them. At the time of Jesus, there was another interpretation of the year of Jubilee. There was another document that was floating around that we've recovered from the caves of Qumran. This document is today called the Heavenly Prince Melchizedek. This was an apocalyptic document full of fire and brimstone written by somebody that just could not imagine something good happening to us without something bad happening to them. In this document, the Jubilee is a symbol and a sign of the end. It meant that God's people, yes, would be freed from slavery and have their property restored, their debts forgiven, and that God would dwell with them. The community of God's people is explicitly identified over and over in this document as us, us, us. And according to most commenters, this document isn't even referring to the whole of the people of Israel, but one small community that finds itself to be more holy than the rest of them. This document again goes on to explain that those outside of this community, again, explicitly, them, 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 they would be made to suffer awful consequences. Jesus, as you imagine, does not quite go so far in his announcement of the Jubilee. There's a reason that this document is not in our Bibles. In fact, Jesus does quite the opposite. Jesus appeals to the action of God done outside of the community of the faithful. First, he appeals to the work done in Capernaum, and that's not so far down the road But Jesus goes on to appeal to the works of Elijah and Elisha. These characters were led by this same spirit that now rests on Jesus to grant the grace of God to people outside of the community of faithful. Jesus is telling the people of Nazareth that the fulfillment of this scripture isn't just for them. It's not just for the people in Nazareth. It's not going to happen just in Capernaum. This jubilee is bigger than that. This jubilee extends to those that you would not dream of including within your community. N.T. Wright says that the reason that the people were enraged is because Israel's God is rescuing the wrong people. At the beginning of the service, Pastor Dinah read for us the story of Cain and Abel. This is another difficult Scripture, another text that's hard to hear and understand. It'll forever spark a discussion, discussion of why God rejects one sacrifice and finds uh, the other one acceptable. But there's something else, another part of that story that I want to explore this morning. The story was likely written during or after the Babylonian exile. Many of us, if we were asked to put ourselves into this story of Cain and Abel, would want to put ourselves in the position of Abel. We're the ones that work hard to provide our best sacrifice to God, and yet it's thwarted by our jealous sibling. The people of Israel, though, in writing this story, have long read themselves into the story, instead in the position of Cain. 
This story is a microcosm of Jewish history. Sacrifice, sin, and exile. The name Cain means to acquire. The sages interpreted the sin of Cain to initially be this drive to acquire, to acquire resources, to acquire wealth, to acquire favor. It is this drive to acquire that leaves Cain so unsatisfied when God rejects his offering. It is this drive to acquire that ultimately leads Cain to kill his brother. And it is this drive to acquire that eventually results in Cain's exile. It is this drive that the sages blame for the eventual expulsion of all of the people of Israel from their land. Instead of carrying forth the liberative work of God, they acquired, and they acquired, and they acquired, and they mirrored the nations around them. Think of the wealth that we're told that Solomon amasses. We don't have a single record that the people of Israel even once practiced a year of Jubilee or even a seventh Sabbath year. They never set their own slaves free, but they used slave labor to build their temple. They never gave the poor a break from the work, but they sold the poor for silver. They never forgave one another their debts, but they exacted interest. They never gave homes back to the homeless. And they themselves ended up without a home. Isaiah sees the Jubilee as a practice of divine liberation, setting not only the oppressed by poverty free, but those that are oppressed by this desire to acquire. Jesus says that today this scripture is fulfilled. Now here's the good news for those of us in this room. We are fortunately not the people of first century Nazareth. We have the benefit of knowing that Jesus was not thrown from that cliff, that when his words were rejected, he merely went on about his task. He never went back to Nazareth, according to the Gospel of Luke. We are not those people of Nazareth, and we are not Cain. We are instead the body of this risen Christ. We are the community of the faithful that are indwelled with the same spirit that was on Christ and given the same task that he was given. We are called to do good news for the poor, to call forth liberty for the imprisoned and sight for the blind, to liberate those oppressed by the empire, and we are called to bring forth a year of the Lord's favor, a year of jubilee. I still think, though, that we are left with a question. And that question is today, are those scriptures fulfilled in us?